This week on Oklahoma Horizon. We continue our series of reports on what a difference a year can make. Our Andy Barth returns to Western Oklahoma to check on cattle producers who are bouncing back after last year's devastating drought. Ponds are filled up and tremendous difference from last year. Our Keela Kellen saddles up for a cattle drive through central Oklahoma. We are having a ball. Lots of fun, lots of excitement, and a few people throwing off the horse. We re-examine the ongoing problem of something called a food desert. Food desert is a neighborhood where there's literally no place to find real food or whole food. That there are only convenience stores and, and fast food chains. Delia Davis explains why eating cheap may be costing you in the long run. About $180 uh, dollars a month uh, for a family of four. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. 2011 was a tough year for Oklahoma cattle producers. A year-long drought dried up pastures, and hay was both scarce and expensive forcing many cattle producers to liquidate their herds and call it quits. Last summer, we sent our Andy Barth to check on those hardest hit, and today he's back in southwestern Oklahoma to see what a difference a year can make. Rob, it's a different site here at the Apache Cell Yards, where just one year ago, cattle trailers were backed up as far as the eye could see, and cattle were being sold where water and grass were plentiful. But now, cattle producers who were once threatened with the thought of dispersal are now trying to rebuild their herds. Rain clouds roll in over southwest Oklahoma and hydrate a very thirsty ground. We haven't had the, the temperatures that we had last year early on. We have green grass now. Um, ponds are full of water. Cattle are fat and happy. Justin Myers is one of the cattle producers we visited last year and his company decided not to disperse their cattle herd. A decision Meyer says is paying off. We weren't selling last year. We, we held on through the drought, and the calf price is really good right now. Uh, the cow-calf producer has a chance to make some money right now, even with $3 road diesel and that sort of thing. Um, wheat farmers got a chance to make some money this year. Uh, the outlook here is a lot better. And Caddo County conservationist Daniel Whaley says all of this rain is bringing. Smiles, rainfall amount, brings happy campers, higher yields, um, grass, hay. The rain brings more than just high morale. Whaley says the drought was a learning experience for many. I think last year prepared a lot of us um, for those conditions when a lot of the younger people that work in my agency haven't been through that type of situation. I definitely had never been through a drought that substantial. Um, it taught you to prepare a little bit better. It taught you to prepare your producers a little bit better um, to get them in the right mindset for grazing management systems that could cause a drought. You need to prepare the year before that, which is hard to predict. Nobody ever can predict that. but. Um, grazing populations, I think, has been a huge impact for everybody in the county. I think they figured out real fast, all the producers, okay, I'm over grazing, so my numbers need to go down. And numbers did go down, and prices shot up, with cattle supplies at their lowest in years. The market's high, which means, you know, the production level is not what we would like it to be. We, we want to get back to the levels we were at. Um, it's going to be too costly for a lot of individuals to just jump right back into the numbers that they had before. The sales are, are way down, the numbers aren't there, um, and what is selling is basically going south. Um, you know, northern Texas is taking quite a bit of what our production was. So it's going to take, I think, at least three to four years to recover from just the production levels that we were at. It's kind of what we're predicting. Um, you're going to see a lot of people holding on to their heifers. Um, a lot of heifers are going to be held back this year. We met back up with state trooper and cattle producer Brent Lancaster, 
who is in the process of rebuilding his herd. Well, last year we, we didn't have any rain at all. We hardly got anything, and the grass uh, would not grow. The ponds were going dry, and it was pretty bad for livestock. We sold out every cow we had. And this year, when it's been raining every week or 10 days, we've been getting good rains. Had a mild winter, lots of winter grass, and the cows done really well. So in February, we started buying cows back, and, and the grass has done really well. Ponds are filled up, and tremendous difference from last year. Taking back their property, their cattle, and their lives. But for the Oklahoma farmer, it's just another day on the job. Now last year's hay shortage was astronomical, which drove prices through the roof. But this year, hay producers are not only looking to supply themselves with the hay that they need, but also North Texas as well. So it sounds like cattle producers will be able to rebuild their herds, but what about area farmers? Well, Rob, hay is not the only crop that's doing well here in southwestern Oklahoma. Wheat producers were expecting to get 35 to 40 bushels for their wheat, but now they're getting 60 bushels per acre. All right. Thank you, Andy. You're welcome, Rob. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, starting in about 1840, close to 20 million head of cattle made their way through Oklahoma on cattle drives that from start to finish could stretch for a thousand miles. Now the advent of wider rail service and then the cattle truck made the cattle drive a thing of the past. Yet even today, names like the Chisholm and Shawnee Trails live on in Western lore, enticing a whole new generation to head them up and move them out. Joining me now is our Keila Kellen. While today's cattle drives may not go for thousands of miles, and the herds are significantly smaller, the Old West spirit is still kept alive by some hardy individuals who each summer take time to celebrate our Western heritage. Hooked and harnessed and ready to go, these horses know what it takes to pull a wagon. Go boys, yep. And starting at the Rockin' Ranch, just outside the small town of Oilton, Oklahoma, wagon enthusiasts from all over come to take part in Old Timers Weekend. We rounded up all the cowboys, and, and I think we have about 24 or 25 wagons now that have arrived from Kansas, Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, all over the place. And while it's the love of the Old West that brings cowboys here, it's the work of organizer John Ogle that made this event happen. Well, this is about my third year participating in this type of venue where we bring the wagons together. We did it in Enid and different places. And, and of course, I was very much involved in the uh, Oklahoma uh, Centennial, which I had the lead wagon for that. And we had, uh, of course, a lot of fun. And so it kind of gets in your blood. And what makes this particular wagon train so realistic are the cattle that keep the cowboys busy. We teamed up with my good friend Gannon Quimby, who's some great, uh, some calves and uh, a, a great little herd of calves. And so we hooked up with him and had a cattle drive. He's uh, bringing in the cattle, the steers, and then of course all the wagons and lots of cowboys and outriders. And while this only stretched 10 miles, we love our state and we're celebrating some great history today. Ogle and all the others believe that celebrations like this help keep the true grit of the Old West alive. We are having a ball. Lots of fun, lots of excitement, and a few people throwing off a horse, but we're loving every bit of it. Riding into town, no worse the wear. The cattle and the cowboys paraded down Main Street celebrating a piece of our past. We have the cattle drive, we have the wagons, we have lots of cowboys, but I think that gives probably most of us joy uh, that are part of the Western community is just to watch the kids face. A celebration for everyone as both young and old get involved to watch a blacksmith exhibit his craft. So we're reflecting on the past, but we're also celebrating the future. So while this year's cattle drive was just for fun, Everything from tack to their wagons are all authentic. So it sounds like this hobby could get kind of expensive. Well, Rob, it's not cheap, 
but several of the people I talked with say that they look forward to taking part in these events every summer. Well, it certainly is a neat event. Thanks so much, Kim. You're welcome, Rob. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, the true cost of good nutrition. Fruits and vegetables are less expensive than the less healthy foods. But first, making our way through a food desert. Well, it's called a food desert, an area, whether rural or urban, where fresh food is simply unavailable. And while inconvenient for some, for others, food deserts can contribute to everything from a neighborhood's decline to malnutrition and obesity. Today, we re-examine an issue we first discovered in 2009, but still remains a problem today. It's the end of the growing season in this neighborhood garden. It tastes real good, especially when they're fresh picked radishes, they're real hot. <laughs> Russell and his brother Reuben have spent much of their summer picking vegetables they planted themselves. Instead of going to the store and pick and buying the groceries, you can come out here and get it freshly picked. Made possible by a program called Food for Life. So we're doing this all over Tulsa area. It's behind schools, it's behind churches, it's in communities, neighborhoods. Right here. Stephen Everly is the fruit. project well, coordinator. In case if the blossom doesn't drop off, then it it's gets Food wet. for Life, it's a program that Indian Health Care applied for through a grant, three grants actually. It's called Food for Life. We're using USDA money, CDC money, and tobacco settlement money combined together for a three-year program, which we're ending food deserts in many neighborhoods and also providing food security for many individuals. Those are good. By helping families grow for their own table, Yolanda Van Prague is Russell and Ruben's mother. It's less expensive and fresh fruits, vegetables are always better for you. And for many low-income neighborhoods, hard to find. These gardens are located in a food desert, an area that lacks convenient access to nutritious food. Food desert is a neighborhood where there's literally no place to find real food or whole food. That there are only convenience stores and, and fast food chains. That there is no place to buy a loaf of bread, milk, cheese, meats, dairy, and fresh vegetables. They literally don't exist. Now for many neighborhoods here in Tulsa, finding a local grocery store can be about a 10 mile trip. Not a huge problem if you're driving in a car, but if you're dependent upon public transportation or on foot, it makes finding fresh food virtually impossible. Here in West Tulsa where windows are replaced with wood and grocery stores are all but non-existent, the blue jackalope serves as sort of a food oasis in what was a food desert. I started observing people in the neighborhood who didn't have access to a supermarket. We lost two major sized supermarkets within a, a 10 minute walk from here over the, over the course of a couple of years. So Scott sparked his entrepreneurial spirit and started the blue jackalope, a neighborhood market that's an oasis of fresh food and warm fellowship. When I found out that a lot of my neighbors on food stamps existed off of going to convenience stores for their food source, it really kind of hit home. Scott's managed to turn his store into a one-stop shop for this community. In addition to providing an array of essential groceries and local produce, it's also a deli, a coffee bar, and perhaps best of all, a central hub of social activity. They'll sit down at the table, it's a communal table, and they'll start conversations with people and then they will do informal networking and that has gotten people who are underemployed or unemployed in the neighborhood day labor jobs. More than anything, it's just become a place where neighbors are meeting neighbors, whether within our community or, or across the broader scope of, of the city that we live in. And food deserts are not just confined to the inner city. Of Oklahoma's 77 counties, almost half are considered food deserts. All of these here in rural Oklahoma. And of these counties, nine are considered severe food deserts, which means it takes about a 10 mile trip to get to the local grocery store. And many of our rural residents are, uh, are elderly 
and also uh, lower income and we have higher poverty in rural populations. Doug Walton is an advocate for the local food movement and says despite the farms that dot our countryside, in many ways, it's our rural areas that have been hit the hardest. And, and transportation becomes a huge issue in rural counties as the distance from the store increases. And so the options that are left are often convenience stores um, or very small uh, grocer uh, type stores that lack selection and also tend to have higher prices. And while long stretches of road are often to blame in rural areas, it's the simple lack of transportation that limits others in Oklahoma City. Within the shadow of the state capitol, Kevin Johnson walks blocks past closed food stores to just pick up a bag of groceries. Well, yeah, they really kind of spread out around here. Ain't too many around here, so and not, not really easy. You have to kind of just go go a little ways, whatever. And when on foot, that's not so easy. At the intersection of MLK and 23rd, you can hear the vibrance of the neighborhood. Hometown Market is one of the last grocery stores in this area. Inside, the aisles are bright and the food is fresh, something store manager Chris Carter says has helped them succeed where others have not. Uh, we, we struggle hard and, and try hard to provide everything we can for a consumer that's looking for whatever product they may be looking for. Um, yes, I think we have a great produce department. Um, I think we have the freshest produce that any money can buy. So, and, and we work hard to do that, very hard. Carter says while he's proud of the fresh produce his store offers, he understands why some smaller retailers have abandoned the healthier fare. Ultimately, it's, it's a customer's choice. Um, you could provide them nothing but healthy foods, and that still doesn't mean they're going to buy it. We're killing ourselves in Oklahoma on the dollar menu. That's where we're eating, rich or poor, food stamps or not. We're eating processed food only, and it's killing us. We see children with type 2 diabetes that shouldn't have it at all, but they're obese. They're eating nothing but processed food full of sugars and salts, and, and, and that's the dilemma. A dilemma that like Eberly and others believe can be solved by one healthy corner store at a time. Now since we finished that story, the Oklahoma legislature passed legislation to allow for low interest loans to entrepreneurs who want to open healthy neighborhood groceries in areas without a corner store. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast. Visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Well, according to the U.S. Department of Commerce, the price of fresh produce has increased by 40 percent since 1980, while the price of sodas and processed foods have actually declined between 10 to 30 percent. But a new study shows that while we may be paying more for healthier food, we are at the same time getting a better bargain when compared to buying junk food. With more, here's our Delia Davis. No one will argue that junk food is better for you. So when you go to the grocery store and you're trying to stay on a budget, you might want to put down the Twinkies and pick up a banana because it's also better for your budget. Shopping for fresh fruits and vegetables can get expensive, but new research shows they may be the best bargain in the grocery store. If you measure by edible gram or by the average amount eaten or the average portion size, that fruits and vegetables are less expensive than the less healthy foods. This is good news for those of us trying to eat a healthy diet, especially those of us trying to meet a healthy diet on a limited food budget. Andrea Carlson is an economic researcher at USDA and says, while fruits and vegetables can be more expensive, that when eaten, they actually make you feel fuller than junk food. Take a chocolate covered donut. It's quite tasty, but it's 240 calories. You can easily eat at least one, two, probably even three of those without feeling very full. However, if you choose a medium-sized banana, you are likely to feel fuller, and that's only 105 calories. If you're really hungry, you might be able to eat two of those. So actually feeling fuller while eating fewer calories. The director for the USDA Center of Nutrition Policy says, filling our stomachs with empty junk food calories can actually empty our pockets as well. On the average, consumers today 
are spending about $180 uh, dollars a month uh, for a family of four uh, to consume uh, a not so nutritious diet. Uh, and in fact, according to our low cost food plan, uh, they can in fact consume a, a, a diet uh, that meets uh, all of our dietary needs on a budget for about $175 a month, and that's for a family of four. So fruits and vegetables and dairy foods and protein foods as well as whole grains all fit within a dietary uh, structure uh, within also the budgetary uh, constraints. Good news for anyone watching their pocketbook as well as their waistline. And researchers say junk food is responsible for many of the calories most kids eat, which may be the reason why 35 of every 100 kids in the U.S. is considered overweight. If you're interested in Oklahoma culture, you can keep up with us throughout the week on the Red Dirt Chronicles blog. Look for our On the Horizon postings on Tuesdays and Fridays and tell us what you think. Well, eating healthier both in school and out is the focus of a new video series aimed at elementary school age children. And our Andy Barth was there for its big debut out in the garden. We've all seen the produce stands in farmers markets on the side of the road. But here in Oklahoma City, it's all about education. It helps our children make connections to where does their food come from. It's not coming just from the grocery store. It starts at a farm. Chris Kirby is the director of Farm to School at the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry and is announcing the completion of a year-long project for students. With the Farm to School program, we're introducing two new resources with the program that we're very excited about. One is a cookbook that's geared towards school food service, incorporating locally grown produce into the school cafeterias, and it's just absolutely wonderful. And then the other one is a five 22-minute video series where children go to the farm, and then they explore through the farm, and then they bring the produce back, and then they learn how to cook it. But it's really a fun, educational packed video series that I think people will really enjoy. And Kirby says the program works with schools to put a better lunch on students' tables. In the schools, they're really looking to serve more fresh fruits and vegetables and farm products through farm to school, um, both on a statewide level, but it's also a national level, too, with the USDA, the encouragement of buying directly from your local farmers. So I think that that really helps promote local agriculture, get more of our local farmers involved with our school cafeteria program. But then also the schools are going to be required to, show, to uh, supply or, or serve uh, about twice as many fresh fruits and vegetables for the new school year, so that really offers, e offers even more opportunities for our fruit and vegetable farmers and other farmers as well, more whole grains, um, just a variety of different things. Great curriculum uh, for the children. But as pleased as Kirby is with this educational effort, she knows the program itself isn't enough. It's going to take a more coordinated effort to help students be better. Get more farmers, get more schools, do more activities with our children. You know, it's really fun in, in grilling up asparagus on a grill and showing kids how it grows and encouraging them to try it and then they try it and they love it. Farm visits, uh, you know, there was nothing more delightful than seeing the farms through the eyes of the children. Uh, just exploring and oh my gosh and tasting things and popping watermelons open and just eating them in the field and sweet corn. Uh, it's just really a neat thing to explore that aspect and help children and adults as well make that connection. And helping make that connection is Ag in the Classroom teacher coordinator, Dana Bessinger. We want students to know about agriculture, where their food comes from, and uh, make connections. And also, um, we want them to make healthier choices too, is one of the reasons that we've kind of pushed some of the crops that we've been pushing lately is because we're hoping kids here in Oklahoma will realize some of the great specialty crops raised by farmers and that they'll choose to eat them. We have wonderful Oklahoma farmers, um, whether they're small farmers or large farmers, we don't have enough farmers as it is and we all need to, to work together to provide wonderful food for our state, for our nation and I think sometimes, you know, with anything you can talk about the bad things but I just think, you know, with this program there's wonderful things. Cooking up some healthy Oklahoma food 
straight from the field. So let's pick a couple squaws. And if you'd like to learn more about Oklahoma's Farm to School program, just head to our website at okhorizon.com and click on this week's value added where we have much, much more. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we'll see why the next big thing in Oklahoma aviation is in fact pretty small. Well, we're very proud of our aeronautical engineering area and the uh, unmanned aerial systems that we're, we're, I think, really a national leader in. We'll also meet a new generation of construction workers on Oklahoma Show Over the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, looks like we are out of time. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.